race to win malls and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions. Alcohol, a relaxing drink today, but an essential historical military tool. Freeze drying, the space program past of our instant coffee. The Airstream Trailer, at home transporting families and astronauts. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. Many of us like the occasional drink, be it at festive times, celebrations, or just for relaxing after a long day at work. But did you know that alcohol has many different uses other than drinking, and it has a strong connection to the military? You don't have to go too far back when there was no such thing as anaesthetic. If you were a soldier wounded at the Battle of Waterloo 200 years ago, or Trafalgar with splinters through your leg, they're gonna take that leg off. They're gonna give you rum, the ancient anaesthetic, alcohol. They're gonna get you as drunk as drunk can be. And they're gonna to have to take that leg off in seconds. So alcohol has been used for many different things in medicine over time. From the earliest times, it was used for um, um, anaesthetics, also help clean wounds perhaps, because it would break up some bacterial cells. And for the soldiers in wartime, but also perhaps for a bit of Dutch courage at the same time. Alcohol, in its purest form, is called ethanol, which is the byproduct of fermentation. Fermentation is the reaction of yeast with sugars in foods. Wine and cider come from fermented fruit, while beer and spirits come from fermented barley and rye. Many countries have a national drink. The UK is known for its beer. Russia has vodka. And Italy is famous for grappa. Grappa is a liqueur made from the pulp left over from the winemaking process. So when they've squeezed all the husks and all the grapes and they've got all this stuff left over, it's a further fermentation of this. They get a lot of sugar out of that, but then a lot of alcohol. So it's a very, very alcoholic liqueur, but a very nice flavour, a little bit like raisin, deep grape, um, quite sweet as well. Grappa has been around since 1600 AD, and the Nardini family have been producing grappa in their distillery since 1779, in the ancient town of Bassano del Grappa. Most of the culture have their own distillery. So, for example, we find vodka in Russia, we find uh, uh, tequila in Mexico, uh, rum in the Caribbean. In Italy, because of uh, the very tail end of the uh, farming community was the great harvest, grappa just makes sense to be an Italian national spirit. Nardini start production of their grappa at their Monastia distillery near Treviso. Made from grape pomace, that's the skins, pulp, seeds and stems to you and me, the production of grappa is quite a long and precise process. The pomace is kept in a large, airtight storage area that holds up to 16,000 quintals of pomace, a quintal being a historical measuring unit that is still used in Europe. To us, one quintal is equivalent to 100 kilograms, so 16,000 quintals is almost 1,600 tonnes. The pomace is stored from anywhere between 15 days and 5 months, until the fermentation process has turned the grape sugars into alcohol. 80% of our grape pomace consists of red grapes, mainly Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, while the remaining 20% they are made out of white grapes and what's local here is uh, Pinot Bianco and uh, Friulano. During the distilling process, approximately 900 quintals, or 9,000 kilograms, of pomace is taken to a dealkalizer. Tipper trucks continuously load pomace into a silo. From there, it is gently fed into the cone-shaped dealkalizer via a conveyor belt. Steam rises through the pomace, causing a volatile reaction, which strips the pomace of its alcohol and creates an alcoholic vapor. This vapour passes through a condenser tube where it cools and turns the vapour back into a liquid called phlegm that has an alcoholic content of 18%. Now the steam distillation had a big effect and it was a very positive introduction to the industry due to the fact that they were able to keep a constant temperature and therefore the quality of the product was much more constant. 
the phlegm is collected into tanks and the alcohol level checked. It is then sent to the distillation columns. As alcohol has a lower boiling point than water, the aim of this process is to separate the alcohol from the phlegm by the introduction of heat. Nardini used three large columns to distill their grappa. The first is seven meters high and is comprised of layers that are divided by perforated plates. Powered by steam at the base, each of these sections has a different temperature, starting at 102 degrees Celsius at the bottom and cooling to 78 and a half degrees up at the top. This allows the phlegm to continually condense and vaporize as it passes up the column, which results in an intense and highly concentrated alcoholic vapor emerging from the top. This process is called rectification. The liquid then passes through to the smaller column too, where it is further rectified with only 60% of this liquid making it to the final column. Here, a type of alcohol called methanol is removed by vaporization, as it will impair the grappa's flavor if left in. The remaining grappa then returns to column two again for further rectification before it can be sent to the collection silos. The production of grappa isn't the only export from the factory. The dealkalized pomace is collected and placed onto a conveyor belt and put through a rotary drum dryer. The pomace is dried at temperatures of 150 degrees for 10 minutes. Once dry, the pomace leaves the drum dryer and passes through a separator, which separates the remaining seeds and skin from the pomace from the conveyor belts into two separate silos. The seeds are then sent away to produce grapeseed oil, and the skins are sent away and ground into flour for animal feed. We operate with two distilleries, one in Monastier, where we utilize a column distillation technique, and here in Bassano, in a traditional with a traditional steel, a pot steel. What we do right now, we take the outcome of the grappa producing Bassano, the outcome of the grappa producing Monastier, and we blend it together to create a single blend, which is the base for all of our, our grappa products. The second Nardini distillery at Bassano houses the company's laboratory, where the grappa is scientifically checked and blended to produce the best tasting product. A range of specially aged grappas are also produced on the Bassano site, using 500 Slavonian oak barrels to age the grappa from 3 to 15 years. The Bassano distillery also houses the bottling room. Here, new bottles are collected by machine and washed so they are ready to be filled. Clean bottles are then pushed onto the line where they are collected and filled with grappa, all by automated machine. Once filled, they are quickly moved onto the next line where the caps are fitted, followed by the plastic sleeves, which are fired on via an air gun. The bottles are then moved into line for labelling, where new labels are glued into place. A machine now picks up the bottles six at a time and places them into boxes, so they are ready for distribution around the world. The Nardini factory produces around 4 million bottles of grappa each year, and it is sold all over the world. The only continent where grappa is not sold is Antarctica. The success of grappa proves that alcohol is truly a wicked invention. In the modern world, making that early morning instant coffee or enjoying a quick noodle snack for lunch are fast and easy ways to drink and eat. But there's a lot that goes into creating this simplicity for hungry consumers, and it's a process that has life-saving origins. Humans have tried various ways to preserve food for thousands of years, but the most successful must be freeze-drying. Although a thoroughly modern process, the roots of freeze-drying date back hundreds of years. The ancient Peruvian Incas stored their potatoes and other crops at the top of mountains in order to preserve them. What the Incas didn't realize was that they were essentially freeze-drying their crop by removing water through a combination of severe cold and the change of atmospheric pressure high in the mountains a scientific process called sublimation. If you look at water, water has three phases. It has the gas phase, it has the liquid phase, and it has the solid phase. We know these as steam, water, and ice. If you change the pressure and change the temperature, that's when you go directly from one to another of, say, a solid to a gas directly without going through a liquid phase. That is the process of sublimation. They might not have understood the science, but the Incas appreciated the results of this sublimation, with the moisture in the potatoes being drawn off and leaving behind a long-lasting dried food. But it was in the 20th century that the greatest advancements in freeze-drying would be seen. Surprisingly, we have World War II to thank for the technology that would lead to the food products we're all familiar with today. 
Freeze drying originally was developed in World War II. At the time, Britain needed lots of medical supplies from the US, so serums had to be transported across the Atlantic in the safest, stable possible way. Of course, they didn't have uh, advanced refrigeration techniques in shipping as we do today, so another way had to be found because all these serums would have melted or spoiled on the voyage across. So they worked out that if you freeze something completely and then extract the moisture from it, it's taken out any agent internally which could corrupt. So originally it was used predominantly in medical supplies. By carefully freezing blood plasma and penicillin, scientists have unlocked a way of transporting perishable goods to the battlefields of Europe and beyond. And once the war had ended, food producers started to catch on to the advantages of using freeze drying to remove water from their products. You lose the weight of the product, so if it's a vegetable, you actually lose a lot of weight. It's easier and cheaper to transport. Secondly, because there's no water, it makes it much, much harder for bacteria to grow, and whatever food that you have will not spoil as easily. So you could have a much longer shelf life in terms of years, as opposed to maybe a couple of months if you have used some other process which was just sealed without oxygen. It may be an effective way to preserve food, but freeze-drying is also high-tech and expensive to implement. So, how does it work? A typical freeze-drying process would be for the food items to be placed on a shelf in a chamber, where it is rapidly frozen solid, which at a molecular level separates the water molecules from the material. Next, air is forced out of the chamber, which lowers the atmosphere, and a small amount of heat is applied, which turns the frozen water molecules directly into gas, bypassing the liquid phase because of the low pressure. The water vapour flows out of the chamber and turns to ice by condensing on a freezing coil. This process carefully continues for many hours, or even days, and leaves the material completely dehydrated, but structurally undamaged. It can then be placed in dry, airtight containers or packaging where it can last for years without the need of refrigeration. Today we freeze dry quite a lot of things, even things you'll find in the supermarket. I mean, when you buy boxes of, you know, uh, cereals with freeze dried fruits into there, um, we can freeze dry meat, we can freeze dry ice cream. Freeze drying ice cream is really popular, isn't it, with the astronaut program? They can, they, I mean, NASA claim they can freeze dry pretty much anything, so you can really freeze dry anything which has moisture or water internally in it. Much in the same way that perishable supplies need to be transported across the Atlantic in the 1940s, NASA needed to find a way to transport food into space that wouldn't spoil during the long duration Apollo space missions. Freeze drying was an obvious choice for them and resulted in the now famous space ice cream. Although this ice cream was actually only ever used during the 1968 Apollo 7 missions, it became a big money spinner for companies looking to cash in on the public's interest in space, brought on by the moon landings. Today, freeze-dried products stretch much further than experimental and novelty food products. They're commonplace and have become a handy item to have in the cupboard. These products can be quickly reconstituted at home and enjoyed in a matter of minutes. To reconstitute is adding the moisture back. So when you want to, you think about your, you know, the, the cup noodle snacks you get. All of that is freeze dried. The noodles, the peas, the chicken, everything is freeze dried. As soon as you add that water back to it instantaneously, it just brings it back to life. It's the same as coffee. When you add water to freeze dried coffee, immediately you've got a coffee drink. It just brings it all back to life. You just need a bit of warm water. Whether you're the type to enjoy a freeze-dried snack or not, remember the life-saving technology that gave you this amazing preserving technique. Freeze-drying is truly a wicked invention. Sublimation, pressure, cold. As we have seen, freeze-drying may be an amazing technique for preserving food, but it involves industrial-scale equipment and chemistry. But here is a simple way to investigate the science behind the freezing process. The materials that we all need. A pillowcase, an empty bottle, some warm water, gloves, a balloon and a fire extinguisher. For this experiment we need a CO2 fire extinguisher. These extinguishers contain pressurised liquid carbon dioxide, which can be blasted out in a cloud that will starve a fire of oxygen and thus put it out. To be in, we're going to make some dry ice. We take the pillowcase and place it over the end of the nozzle on the fire extinguisher. Make sure you pull up all the loose material so it is a pretty snug fit. Unlock the pin on the extinguisher and discharge. Have we been successful? Yes we have! In the bottom of the bag is some dry ice, which is at a bone chilling minus 78 degrees Celsius. Apart from being a great party trick, 
please don't try this at home, there is a freeze drying reason for doing this. If you look closely, you can see white gas coming off the ice. This, ladies and gentlemen, is sublimation in action. The lumps of carbon dioxide ice are melting, but because of the temperature and atmospheric pressure, the CO2 turns straight from a solid into a gas, bypassing the liquid phase. This is exactly how water is drawn out of food during the freeze drying process. And sublimation is not just a passive action. If we place some of our dry ice into a bottle and add some warm water, you can see the ice reacting with CO2 being finally given off. If we obstruct the top of the bottle by placing a balloon over its end, the pressure of the CO2 being released causes the balloon to inflate. So, there you have it. Dry ice and sublimation, all created with just a fire extinguisher and a pillowcase. Luxury travel, military operations and the space program all have a few things in common, but only one has its own group of civilian enthusiasts all over the world. Very few products can symbolise the all-American experience. As one of the most iconic American products, it has carried everyone from astronauts to famous celebrities. It is the one and only Airstream trailer. The Airstream is a brand of luxury travel trailer characterised by its unique shape of rounded aluminium bodies. It all began with Wally Byam, who was a qualified lawyer from Los Angeles. He began building his own trailers in his backyard in the 1920s. The history of Airstream basically starts in 1931 with uh, Wally Byam, who got his start by actually selling plans for how to build your own camper from an ad that he placed in the back of Popular Mechanics magazine. From there, he actually started building trailers in his backyard and soon after moved into a shop. And uh, 84 or so years later, as they say, the rest is history. Here we are. It was during the 1950s and 60s that the company really began to soar, culminating in 1966 when the iconic Airstream Overlander model was launched. The Overlander's popularity was cemented when NASA recognized its practicality and adopted the trailer into their space program. A modified airtight Airstream trailer was used to quarantine the Apollo 11 crew on their return from space, and the NASA Association didn't stop there. Airstream branched out into motorhomes, and in 1983, a modified Exila motorhome, affectionately named the Astro Van, was adopted by NASA to ferry astronauts to the launch pad of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The Astro Van was a specially designed motorhome chassis that was built to serve as a transportation vehicle for shuttle crews to make their way from their ready area to the launch pad. Uh, the Astro Van, I was involved in building that. Uh, it was basically a 27-foot motor home shell that was laid out as a bus configuration with a spatial seat. Since its creation, the Airstream is the favorite brand of motorhomes and trailers. They are luxurious, very comfortable, and incredibly customizable. Their popularity is still growing all over the world. These iconic leisure vehicles have been produced at the Jackson Center, Ohio, since 1952. The probably the main feature that makes an Airstream so unique is that it is built almost entirely by hand, and it is built to last a lifetime. Highly reliable, um, we use very little automation, we use no robots, it's built strictly by uh, the folks that work here at the plant, and they're uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, that's what makes an Airstream great. The production process basically starts from a flat sheet of aluminum alloy, which is uh, routed and cut and measured up to size and made into two walls, a roof, and then a shell is built. And uh, inside of that shell, we place all of our furniture and finished goods. And um, at the end, you end up with a finished trailer. The first sheets of aluminium are cut and drilled using CNC machines before being riveted to the aluminium rib cage to become a wall. Gradually, more layers are added over the initial sheet to build the shell. It is this monocoque design that gives the Airstream the enhanced durability and distinctive shape. Along with fitting the lights and windows, the two end shells of the Airstream are created by having multiple segments riveted together to create the iconic curved shape and low center of gravity that sets it out from its rivals. The Airstream has evolved over time with some limited amount 
Um, technologically, today's trailer is much more advanced than the trailer that Wally built uh, many years ago. Uh, but overall, the shape and the appearance has remained largely consistent. In fact, we've only changed the shell significantly, maybe five times in the past 80 plus years. The plywood floor is coated and sealed to become waterproof before the two side walls and end shells are riveted together. Now the Airstream's legendary shape becomes recognizable. All the main components are now brought together and the remaining side windows are fitted. In total, there are over 3,000 rivets used to combine all the different sections of the trailer. The huge shell is moved by a conveyor belt, then lifted onto a work table. From here, all the underside panels and mechanics can be accessed easily and fitted. Once you have so many folks needing to work in tandem and produce uh, such a product with such a high level of craftsmanship, it poses a definite challenge, uh, but it's something that we're up to and very proud of. The shell moves from the table to a platform where it is married together with a steel chassis to complete the total enclosure. All remaining features are then added, such as the heavy-duty customized door, bumpers, skirts, and lights. Over the course of time, Airstreams have been used for a very wide variety of purposes besides the obvious camping. Uh, they're currently used for uh, commercial products. Uh, they can be used as uh, sales showrooms. Um, they're even used for uh, diner cars that you can uh, have a meal out of. The Airstream has to then pass the hurricane test, where high pressure water is fired at the unit for 20 minutes, while on board an examiner checks for leaks. Once the weather test is passed, it is time to install the interior. Glue is sprayed onto the inner walls so that thick insulation can be applied. The interior skin is then fitted over the insulation. The floors are sanded and all the remaining units for the living area, kitchen and bedrooms are fitted by hand. Probably the most unusual place an Airstream may have ever been used uh, would be a hotel. There are uh, a couple of hotels around the world that actually use Airstream shells. Uh, placed uh, very high atop uh, the roof of the building and um, folks can uh, use that as their hotel room and uh, sleep in an Airstream at the top of a high rise. Once completed, the Airstream has to pass vigorous inspection tests to make sure everything is in perfect working order before shipping. To me, what makes an Airstream an Airstream is the shiny silver bullet. It's instantly recognizable uh, no matter where you go. Um, people have a sense of nostalgia and a, and a deep affection for the way it looks. A durable brand with a stellar history, that makes the Airstream trailer a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day but have never realised their amazing background. Alcohol, freeze drying and the Airstream trailer, all wicked inventions.